Well, welcome everybody after our break. I am delighted to be able to introduce our next speaker, Konstantinos Katsikopoulos. He's been here at the Max Planck Institute since 2004. Prior to this, he was at MIT in the Engineering Services and Mechanical Engineering Division. He received his doctorate from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in Industrial Engineering and Operations Research. And he did both his master's and his bachelor's at the University of Athens. His work spans many, many areas of interest, including prescriptive decision making, descriptive decision making, and learning and aging. And his findings are applicable to medicine, as well as management, and as well as engineering. On a personal note, he is quite the connoisseur of fish and also an avid swimmer. So I can only imagine that between the two, he gets um, from the ocean a lot of his energy for so much of this prolific research that he does and that we have the uh, joy of getting to hear a little bit about today. So uh, without further ado, our next speaker, Konstantinos Katsikopoulos. Okay, thanks very much, Jennifer. So let me start immediately, actually, by telling you the two points of my talk. There are two points. Uh, so the first one will be to argue why standard decision theory as it's practiced today should be combined with rules of thumb, which is another name for heuristics. And the second point will be to illustrate, through a number of examples, how we have done this combination here at ABC. And during the talk, actually, I will really welcome questions and so on. You don't have to wait until the discussion. So <laughs> I have to start with the first thing, which is, uh, my view, a caricature of how decision theory looks today. With an example. So uh, this actually fits very well with what Gerd said. It's true that the domain of uh, decision theory today is mostly decision under risk. And what do we mean like that? by that? We mean a, qu a problem like this. So you have to choose between two gambles. So in the first gamble, you receive 10 euros with a 50% chance, and you receive nothing with another 50% chance. So that's the first gamble. And the second gamble is you receive 5 euros for sure. So you have to decide which one you prefer. So it's decision under risk because the two alternatives are known, the two gambles. And the attributes of the two alternatives, which are their outcomes and the possible outcomes and the probabilities, are also known. Okay. So this is this is how the solution really lo typically looks like. Uh, they, we, decision theorists, start by assuming that people have a, a utility function and they have a probability weighting function. So both of these functions, what they do is they take the attributes and they transform them. And they transform them in nonlinear ways, as you can see. This specific solution is a solution of prospect theory. In prospect theory, they rename the utility function as a value function. And that's uh, the one you see right here. So it's a the sigmoid function. Uh, so you know, if you get that money, that, that's how much it's worth for you. That's what this means. Right? So it's a transformation. And also you have a transformation of the probabilities. This probability uh, means that much to you. Um, so this is, in some sense, intuitive in a way. Uh, you could say there exist utilities and there exist probability weights. The difference from our approach is that we don't necessarily think that they're combined in the way standard decision theory thinks it's combined. So, Standard decision theory thinks it's combined in that way. So that's exactly the solution in, in, with the algebra. So again, the problem was to decide between this and this. And what you have to do is you have to do three things. For each one of these two options, you have to compute an overall value. That's the value of this option. Right? And that's the value of the other option. You have to make these two computations, and then you have to compare what you get, the value, the overall value of these two options, and then you pick the alternative with a higher value. Um, I'm going to use the terms that standard decision theory as practiced today is exhaustive and integrative. And by exhaustive, I mean two things. It's exhaustive in the sense that you give a chance to all the decision options you consider, meaning you compute the value of this option and you compute the value of this option. 
And also it's exhaustive within its option in the sense that you consider all the attributes, all the outcomes and all the probabilities for each of the options. So it's exhaustive in both of these senses. And it's integrated because this calculation is happening exactly by integrating the outcome with its probability and so on. So there's a chance of compensation. A, a low outcome can be compensated if it has a small probability of occurring. So it's exhaustive and integrated. Now, I want to be a little more fair to decision theory today and uh, acknowledge that, of course, researchers are always very creative. And as Gerd already uh, implied, sometimes people, researchers, are very good at taking what they know and making it fit at the problem they have to solve. So, of course, uh, decision theorists have done much more than just solve these very abstract problems. I don't have so much the time to go through that, so I will try to present to you a little bit a broader view and maybe a fairer view of standard decision theory by talking a little bit about the history of standard decision theory, but by quickly talking about some interesting persons which were part of it. So here I have a question for you. Who are these people? Does anybody know? Yeah. Which one is von Neumann? <laughs> That's von Neumann. That's Morgenstern. And this is Savage. OK. So those people, in a sense, started or restarted it in the 20th century, in the 40s and the 50s. They mostly worked on the theoretical foundations of decision theory, by which they meant mathematical foundations. So they showed that uh, a set of mathematical actions was equivalent to standard decision theory in the sense of expected utility theory, of which prospect theory is a modification. Um, they were not really, they were seeing it mostly as a mathematical enterprise. They were not really making claims that this is what people do or what they should be doing. Although, as it started unfolding, Savage started talking a little bit about what people should do. And he did say that people should use subjective expected utility theory if they are in a small world, which is similar to what we're saying about making decision under risk, not, the, un, not under uncertainty. Um, it changed, actually, dramatically with the appearance of these two people. So does anybody know who they are? They're actually, in a way, much more important for everything you hear in college and graduate school and business school in terms of decision theory. Everybody <laughs> cites them when they write a paper on decision theory but they're much more responsible about how we see things and about many things we take for granted. So this is Howard Rifa, and the other one is Ward Edwards. So as far as I can tell by trying to pick out the, the, the history, they really made the push starting from the late 50s and into the 60s and, 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 and going about the claim that uh, standard decision theory could also be used in a large world, as we would say. And mostly the, the crux of it was that you can apply expected utility theory together with Bayesian statistics. Uh, Howard Reifa was very instrumental for that. And then in the end, Ward Edwards was a truly a, a very strong personality and a person who was involved in many different fields, psychology, engineering, operations, research, decision analysis, and he really helped mold a lot of what's in, in, in the courses today. And the main difference, so as I said, this happened more in the 50s and 60s, and here more in the 40s and 50s. The main difference is that from the abstract gamble problems that I just showed you before, they moved to more concrete problems, more real problems. And they said again that those could be attacked with the tools of standard decision theory. So here's a problem like that. It's more concrete. <laughs> So these are two companies, and you have to judge their stock values. You need to have some information, and other information is not going to be exactly outcomes and probabilities, but it's going to be what we call attributes. And what here at ABC and in psychology more generally is called cues. So you have to make them numerical eventually if you're going to do some math with it. 
And they're often binary, the attributes. So you could say that uh, the first attribute of uh, object A or decision option A is one. If this object is a, an American company, it will be zero otherwise. That's a little bit how it works. And after that, you could play the same game as with prospect theory, and you can have another weighted additive formula. So this is the value for company A, and this is the value for company B. These are the attribute values, and they're multiplied by importance weights. The important thing here is not the formula. If you're not so comfortable looking at the symbols immediately, the point is that this is approach is, again, exhaustive and integrative, in the sense I said before. Every one of the decision options, A or B, gets a chance, has a value assigned to it. Uh, this value is assigned as a, uh, as, a as a product of an exhaustive and an integrative calculation. And if you want to be more sophisticated, then you're going to use a Bayesian model. And this generally looks like that. You take all the information you have on all the attributes of both objects, from the first attribute until the last uh, attribute of both objects, and you try to compute the probability that one object really has a higher value than the other object. And if this probability is in favor of A, you choose A, otherwise you choose B. So if you don't like the formulas, maybe you prefer this. This says exactly the same things. We have three attributes or three Qs, whether the company is an American company, whether it's listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and whether it's been around for more than 20 years, for example. And we always exhaustively and integratively compare, uh, combine those values in order to get an estimate for the stock value, and we use that to make our decision. And this is both the case for the linear model and for the Bayesian model. Now let me get to the point of the first part of my talk, which, as I said, is to argue that decision theory has to change. So it has to change because it has some challenges. Every method, of course, has some challenges, but the challenges here I'm going to say they are, in a way, serious. So I'm going to show all of this graphically. So you have the three attributes. And in the linear world, in the linear model, you try to put them together so that you estimate the value of a company. And as I just said, in order to do that, you need to know these weights. Now, it depends if this is an objective or a subjective problem. Uh, so if it's an objective problem, you have to estimate those from some data. If it's a subjective problem, you have to elicit them from a decision maker. And as you can well imagine, both of these things are difficult. Often we don't have the data, and often the decision maker can simply not tell us how important each one of these attributes is to them. In the Bayesian world, there are also problems. You can illustrate with the same graphic, essentially. The point is to say something about the probability of a specific value of the stock based on these attributes. And in general, this computation actually is intractable. Uh, this, uh, again, researchers are very um, resourceful in making this computation tractable by putting additional assumptions. And overall, these assumptions could be uh, cast in, as the, the form, in, in the form of causality assumptions. So for example, if really we could say that the stock value really causes the values of these things, if you could say this, for some of them it looks more plausible, for others less plausible, but if you could say this, then these three things are conditionally dependent given the criterion as we say, and in the end, the end, the fact from a practical point of view is that you can, the Bayesian model reduces to what is called naive base. That's what I wanted to get to. So you can do the computations the Bayesian way if you make additional assumptions and you use what's called naive base. But this is also a challenge in the end that you have to assume these things are not always true and so on. And the final uh, problem is, is a social problem. Uh, in practice now, a decision analyst is going to work with a decision maker and try to guide him through him or her through working with these models and deriving an answer and then seeing if they want to accept the answer or redo it. They perhaps may do a sensitivity analysis and so on. Um, and simply the point is if you do the decision analysis classical elicitation uh, of utilities and probabilities in the sense of uh, Kinney and Rifa, then a lot of people argue that decision makers themselves actually do not like this and resist 
Of course, a lot of decision analysts see a lot of value in that, and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. But overall, it is a challenge. It's never trivial for the decision maker to accept these methods. So the next thing I'm going to say is that um, despite facing these challenges, an interesting reaction happened in term, from the point of view of decision theory. So uh, they, they thought that all these challenges are mostly a feature of applying the theory. And it just means they should keep working on making the application more feasible and more effective rather than changing the theory per se. They're happy with the theory. They think the theory is fine. It doesn't need to be changed. The only thing that needs to be changed is how it's applied. So that's a nice way of uh, making the segue into, uh, into our own theory. So in a sense, you could say we take these challenges a little more seriously. And we think that we should consider a new theory which could be combined with the old theory. So based on this reasoning, um, I'm going to present to you now in the second part of the talk uh, this new decision theory, which is the theory of heuristics, and can also be called rules of thumb. So it's called rules of thumb in the biology and behavioral ecology literature. It's called usually heuristics in literature, as in psychology, computer science, operations research, and so on. Um, it's a different world when you get your inspiration from mathematical actions or when you get your inspiration from empirical evidence. And we did the second, and a lot of it comes from, from such interesting creatures as the Norway rat, which is also known as the sewage rat. Norway rat is a euphemism for the sewage rat. So this lives in the sewage system and often has to solve the problem of deciding what to eat. And uh, more or less through a behavioral experiment with this rat, Gallef was able to argue that one of the heuristics or rules of thumb that this uh, rat uses is to not ever try a food that it does not recognize. Recognition here went through smelling the breath of other conspecifics. And from that, if there's an unrecognized uh, smell, then you can tell that what they just ate, you've never countered before, so you don't want to do this. So this rule of thumb is not exhaustive because some of the decision options are not considered at all. The non-recognized decision options are not considered at all. So it's already a different approach from standard decision theory uh, in the sense that, uh, as I just said, the, not all decision options are uh, considered. The regular honeybee also is not exhaustive in their decision making in the sense that um, they do consider different flowers for pollinating, but they do not do the integration, uh, they, do, they do not do the evaluation of these decision options by considering all the attributes of the different flowers. And also they do not do it integratively. They do it exactly in the lexicographic way that Gerd presented before in the sequential way by considering the odor, the color, and the shape in that sequence of different flowers for deciding whether they want to go to this flower or this flower there in the background. So they also don't behave as decision theorists. And finally, in a way, that's, that's my favorite because he's the one that illustrates more that we need to think more about standard decision theory. And he's the most creative. This is. Uh, leptothorax albipennis, and what he does, he actually creates his own attributes for solving a, a decision problem. So the problem is to estimate the size of a candidate nest cavity. In order to do this, uh, what, what it does is that it goes around the cavity on an irregular path, leaving a thermal trail. So it does that once. Then it takes a break. And then comes back and does it again. Goes again around the cavity, again on an irregular path. Uh, it takes care so that the path is actually different from the path that it used the first time. And then somehow it can track and it can remember uh, how often it re-encountered re the, the old trail because it had, it had led uh, pheromones there. So then he uses this re-encounter frequency as a proxy for the, for the size of the cavity nest. So 
If you want to read more about that, uh, you can see one of the readings, which is the reading by Gerdon Hatch, which used to be our behavioral ecologist here many years ago. And it has a lot of these stories and a better and more detailed explication of the connection between rules of thumb and heuristics. What I'm going to do, I'm going to use the examples I just gave you to make a small summary and claim the following, uh, which I haven't demonstrated yet, but I will. So we've got inspiration from rats, honeybees, and ants, and started thinking whether people also use heuristics to make decisions. Now, as I said before, heuristics is, to a large extent, the same jargon as rules of thumb. There are some important differences which I'm just going to mention, then drop. For example, biologists and behavioral ecologists are much more interested in uh, understanding the evolutionary basis of rules of thumb. That's not always popular in psychology, and it's not always being done so much. Psychologists also recognize that, at least for humans, there are other influences except ev evolution. For example, uh, individual learning, social learning, institutions, and so on. But from now on, heuristics equals rules of thumb from us. And uh, I want to summarize again this very important point. The point is, based on the examples I just showed you, the heuristics we build, they're not exhaustive and they do not integrate. And the way we do it is not verbally, but by uh, casting the heuristics in the form of simple mathematical models. And the basis of these models are exactly people's core psychological capacities. I'm going to tell you what those are as, uh, as we go through. So again, let's go back to Ward Edwards' problem. It's a concrete problem that a human now has to solve. Which one of two companies has a higher stock value? And we have the different attributes. So the recognition heuristic is based on the core capacity of being able to recognize the names of things. So in this case, you would recognize Apple, but not Barry. So most people actually would go with Apple. You have a question? No? So you can write it more precisely like this. So you predict that one object is larger than the other when the first one is recognized and the second not. The core capacity here at work is uh, recognition, name recognition especially. The talent heuristic is based on another capacity that virtually all of us uh, develop if we go to school. And this is simply, um, shouldn't look exactly like that. This one should be down there. But you get the point. This is just arithmetic. This is just summing or tallying things. So you tally all the evidence in favor of one object, of one company, and you just go with uh, of both companies, and you go with a company with the most uh, evidence in terms of this simple sum. And something that is more um, central for us and I'm going to talk mostly in the rest of the talk in terms of a heuristic is lexicographic heuristics, which formally can be written like that. This is mostly to show you that we can do this. We can write in a way that's completely unambiguous. But if you don't like re reading formulas, all that this says is that you take the first discriminating cube. That's all that it says. So you can also illustrate it like this. Again, to companies, you start looking at the queue sequentially. If the first queues are the same, you go to the second queue and so on, until you find a queue that discriminates, and then you go with the corresponding object. So this is a lexicographic heuristic, and take the best is one. Um, one of the first results that started showing to us that there is something in these heuristics was this from Jean Cherlisky. Um, if you uh, compare regression with these two heuristics, you find that in the end, the text the best heuristic, which is a lexicographic heuristic, is more accurate in prediction than uh, regression is. And this happened about 15 years ago, and it has kept being fleshed out and extended in other problems and so on. This is one of the extensions in which the main difference is that uh, uh, we're using very small uh, calibration set. So this is the size of the training set. It goes only from two objects up to 50% of the objects. And this is predictive accuracy on the test set. And we have a bunch of methods here which are the same as before with the addition of naive base, is this rhombus here. And the main result just to see from this graphic is that this thick bold line, which is take the best, actually outperforms 
even naive base. This is also an average of 20 problems, I should have mentioned that before, as was in the previous slide, 20 very different real-world decision problems. So these are averages. Again, the point being that we have by now quite a lot of evidence that uh, uh, these simple heuristics can outperform models like regression and naive base in this case. Uh, I'm going to rush a little bit through that because Gerd already went through it. This is due to Green and Mare who are doctors practicing in Michigan. And uh, this is another problem, and what I want to show you is something about the breadth of the theory of heuristics. It could be applied to something different than companies, medical decision making and categorization tasks. But in a way, there's a unification. In a way, the methods are surprisingly the same. So it's another example of Sengwa's theory integration. But it's, it's a different result. So this would be how logistic regression would look. For every combination of systems, you get a probability that the person is at a high risk of having a heart disease and should be admitted to the emergency care. The fast and frugal tree does not bother with that, but it's also sequential. It's also lexicographic in the sense that after it has inspected only one attribute, there's always the chance that it makes a decision and stops. If it doesn't stop immediately, when it inspects the next attribute, again, it can make a decision and stop. So at every time, at every step you do this, you have a chance to exit and make a decision very quickly. And again, the reason why I wanted to show this is to show that the fast and frugal tree can be integrated exactly with take the best and the psychographic heuristics for the previous multi-attribute problems. And I'll try to show that now quickly, graphically. This is somehow the full Bayesian tree. In the Green and data, there were really 89 people. And 33 of those, um, they had an elevated ST segment in the electrocardiogram, and then 10 of those had this, and they also had no chest pain and so on. You know how to read this. Standard decision theory would look at the end nodes and would use all of them. In fact, it would even use the whole tree if it's more sophisticated. The one way of looking at the fast and frugal tree is that it implements this radical pruning. So basically, it says that all these people that have an elevated ST segment are the same, independently of the other attributes. And there's some more pruning going on here, right? Um, in effect, what the fast and frugal tree does is exactly the same. It makes a cutoff here on that Q profile or attribute profile, as we can call it, 0, 1, 1. And it says that every patient that has a Q profile that is lexicographically larger than that is a high-risk person, otherwise they're a low-risk person. So in that sense, we were able to in integrate fast and frugal tree. So we take the best. They're formally exactly the same thing. That's in terms of the fast and frugal tree, what just showed you with the numbers. And again, we did more of this uh, testing. This is uh, 11 medical data sets, so it's an extension of the Green and Merge study. And we have two kinds of models. The blue model is the classification and regression trees by Breiman. We also have the logistic regression, they are the blue. And the two green ones are two different ways of constructing uh, fast and frugal trees. And on the x-axis, as you go that way, you have less and less data to calibrate your models. Here you use all the data. Here you use 90%. Uh, and until the end, you use only 15%. And here you have uh, the accuracy based on that. And you can see a clear trend. You can see that sometimes it looks better for the more sophisticated standard decision theoretic optimization models, and sometimes it looks better for the heuristics. And on the whole, it looks better for the standard models when there's more information. The blue bars are higher here, but in this case, eventually the green bars take over. So, let me sum up something about this new theory of heuristics that we have, the way I see it. So, heuristics do not need a lot of information. They have fewer parameters and easier parameters to calibrate than the standard models. And you could expect, it hasn't exactly been shown, but maybe it has been kind of shown anecdotally, at least to the extent that Green and Merck wanted to use the fast and frugal tree, but they didn't want to use logistic regression. That heuristics are easy for decision makers to understand. 
Now, recall that these were the two main challenges of uh, standard decision theory, according to what we said before. And those do not really exist here. The heuristics do not have to face these challenges. And always the point was that theoretically you needed, these were necessary evils, you needed a lot of information, you needed something harder if you wanted to have higher performance. But as I just alluded to you, and you also saw from some of Gerd's results, this is actually not always the case. It is sometimes the case, but not always. It's definitely possible that heuristics can perform better than standard decision theory. To be fair, also vice versa. It's not that heuristics are always better. Sometimes standard decision theory is better. They could even be better more often. We just exactly don't know. We haven't gathered all the data. But the point is that certainly heuristics deserve a chance in the sense they don't have to face these challenges, and they don't seem to be sacrificing, at least not always, performance. So with that, I'm going to uh, go to the last part of my talk, which is what already has been uh, described to you as the ecological rationality of heuristics, which is the study of conditions under which exactly we have standard decision theory performing better than heuristics. This is a summary. There are many other summaries. There are many review articles right there. This is from the, from the other article by myself that's in your readings. That could be seen as a first fact. So this is a little bit informal now. What do I mean by not very large performance differences? I'm talking about the number of percentage points. If you were quick in seeing it before in the graphs, sometimes these differences, they're about 1%, 3%, at most 5%. In a way, you could say that's not very large, but something that I would like to uh, insist on, that of course this could be very, very important. If you're talking about 1% over millions of people that take this treatment, it's immediately clear that it's very important. But still, there is a sense in which the differences are not very large. This is actually something good to remember. The comparative advantage of heuristics, I hope you saw already from Gerd and from my slides on results, has to do with prediction mostly. If they are better, they're better in prediction rather than fitting. And finally, maybe to put it all together, we always have to remember that one can be better than the other. Now in the next slide, this is also from the, from the 2010 paper, I'm gonna present some very quick explanations so that you get again the big picture of ecological rationality, that's the point. I'm gonna go into very little detail on that, but I wanted to at least try to give you the big picture. A way of, in the end, anticipating and explaining the not very large performance differences is the so-called phenomenon of flat optima in linear models. I didn't say it, but with cryptographic heuristics actually uh, could be seen as making the same outcomes as a specific kind of linear models. Tallinn was already a linear model where you were uh, adding everything. Regression is a linear model. A naive base also can be rewritten as a linear model. So because of that, and, and in linear models, what we know is that changes in the parameters of the, in, the, in the weights of the attributes do not change performance so much. So from that sense, somehow in a general way, we can expect that there wouldn't be huge differences. That's something just to keep. We're not going to talk about that again. In terms of the predictive or the superior predictive accuracy, you heard already Gerd finished his talk with uh, Henry Brighton's bias, variance, dilemma, or trade-off. So I hope you got that. I'm not going to go into that again. This is a way of understanding why the amount of information affects parameter estimation, which was one of the main results you saw. And there's this due to Robin Hogarth and Natalia Carlaya, which also offers a partial explanation for prediction. Uh, very quickly, linear cognitive ability is a measure of how well a person, how consistently a person applies a linear model in a world that's kind of linear. So um, if this is high, if this is low, heuristics end up uh, doing better than linear models in prediction. Something that I want you to appreciate is that there are many different pieces of the puzzle and all of those contribute something, but there's not a full picture yet. And finally, I'm going to talk about these two concepts in the next few slides. Mostly as an exercise, first because it's complementary of what you just saw. There's no bias, variance, dilemma here. 
And second, because I think, I hope I can show you the challenges that somebody can, can face when they're doing this work. And as I said, more details on that are in the decision analysis paper. So first I have to write down what the validity of a Q is. And this is the, the, the rule according to which Qs are ordered and take the best. This is the formula. And again, all that this says is the validity of the Q is how often a Q points to the right object, the really bigger object, when it points to any object at all. For example, if we really, and then, and then take the best orders, the Qs by the validity. So this could mean that in five cases uh, of the sample we're looking at, uh, this specific Q, the first Q, discriminates between the two objects, so it has a different value, that means. And in four out of these five cases, uh, the object with the higher value is really the, with the higher Q value is really the object with the higher criterion value. So let's say we have these three Qs, and we order them that way. Um, then the question we can ask is how accurate is take the best? And I'm going to give you a result, and then we can think, what does that tell us? It's really not so clear, and in a way, the hardest part is to think what the result tells us, and how you can integrate into the existing theory. So the result is a bit of a mouth, uh, mouthful, but it's actually not that hard. Assuming this independence condition that I showed you before when I was talking about naive base, in the end, you can show that take the best can never be outperformed if the validities look like that. And now, I'm not really going to go through that, but I'm going to tell you that what this says is basically that the first Q has a much higher validity than all the other Qs somehow considered together. And then the second Q has a much higher validity than all the Qs that come after that considered together and so on. For example, this really holds here. Let me at least illustrate with a formula. What you would want is that when you take four fifths and you divide it with one fifth, which is four, on this left hand side, this is larger than a product. And this product comes from uh, multiplying two thirds over one third, which is two, times three thirds over two fifths, which is one and a half. So you have four larger than two times one and a half. So it holds. And that gives you an information how the condition looks. This Q is 80% valid. It's actually, in a way, much, much more valid than these two Qs. This one is 66%, this one is 60%. That's kind of what it says. Now, I have a question for you. So we have this. We have our result, and this is a condition, necessary and sufficient, for take the best to be doing really well, actually better than anything else you can think of. But what does that mean? So, already Gerd and I have been beating you over the head with this distinction between prediction and fitting. So this result, what does it refer to? Bazi? Why? Kind of co co confused me a little bit. Uh, I mean, you write in the first part that this result says if you know the first Q is much better than the other Q, you might as well use one fit. That's a little bit one. Key. That's the intuition. For the result to say something about prediction, there should be something about the sampling process. In <laughs> prediction, you calibrate your model in the training set, and you apply the model with the fixed parameters in the test set. There's nothing here in this result that models the sampling process. In fact, this, this here should, could be taken to be the population validities. So in that sense, uh, people, uh, at least Gerd and Henry refer to this as a result that refers to fitting. Now it gets a little more interesting because other people argue more like you did. So Hogarth, Robin Hogarth, for example, says, no, this result applies to everything, prediction and fitting, because you could see these validities being the validities in the training set. So it's a general theoretical result. So it applies to everything. 
as for as for my part, I think that you could argue both ways. I'm a little bit in the middle. But this is, again, my point here was not to get you into these intricacies, but to show you that there's a lot of challenges you need to think. It's actually not so clear that to what extent this helps us understand the superior performance of take the best in prediction. It couldn't be completely unrelated, but it's not clear it goes all the way. Maybe we can compromise like this. And in a way, it could get a little more subtle, and I'm going to demonstrate that in the next result. That's due to Manel cells. So there's the condition of cumulative dominance. So assuming a linear world, that's what this means. Take the best, again, is great. If there's an option that somehow cumulative dominates everything else. So that's, that's an interesting condition. This is how you write it, but it's better illustrated in this case. Here, object A, cumulative dominates object B in the sense, in the following sense. If you look only at the first attribute, A is higher than B, so it dominates. Then, when you go to the second step, you add what you have had so far. So you have 1 plus 0 compared to 0 plus 1, and that's also 1. So nothing dominates this, but this still is not worse than this. And when you go to the third step, you add all of these three values together, 1 plus 0 plus 1, and you compare that with 0 plus 1 plus 0, and then you can see that this, again, cumulative dominates. So this is an example where you have a cumulatively dominant alternative. And if that's the case, Manuel proved that, again, take the best looks very, very good. It's in actually that ideal life sense optimal. But again, what does that say? Is that the result for fitting or prediction? There's nothing to calibrate here. So what I was just telling to Vazi, it seems that it doesn't apply. But quickly, I want to tell you that it's again more subtle in the sense that, in fact, there is something, even though you couldn't see. The decision maker, of course, knows these values or the alternatives, even though maybe necessarily not even that. But if he knew that still, he would have to order the alternatives so that uh, he can apply these conditions. So again, you run into the same problem. So this is the kind of difficult thinking sometimes one needs to do. But overall, we've done quite a lot of it. And again, this is a summary of some stylized facts. There are other variables here that have been proposed. There is redundancy, there's predictability of the criteria, and so on. But I personally wasn't so satisfied on the empirical evidence on those. And lately, together with Greg Wheeler, we're working on incorporating those in one more general framework. What I want to say now is show you how, if you believe this summary, how this can be put together in order to make a genuine combination of standard decision theory and heuristics. So this comes here. It's just an attempt. You could do it in many other ways. But this could also be read as a decision aid. So you could first ask if, if the available information is scarce, if you don't have enough information to calibrate your models. In wanting to be more conservative and give still the benefit of the doubt to the uh, established methods, which are the Bayesian methods and the car trees and so on, you allow here only an exit in favor of these models. So as you saw in the results before, if you have a lot of information, you can go with the standard decision model. That's what this says. If you don't, I wouldn't exactly jump into using heuristics, but I would keep going down this tree. As you keep going down the tree, heuristics start appearing here, here, and here. In a way, I wouldn't exactly want to justify now because we would get into more technicalities, but the point being that this decision aid gives you something like a map. It's a first attempt at a map for generally combining the heuristics and the standard decision uh, uh, theoretic models. Uh, other such uh, summaries are also possible. And now we're almost done. Let me uh, finish by trying also to challenge you a little more uh, with some open problems. So remember the Norway rat? Uh, Something that ABC and, and other people who got interested in this approach haven't really followed up is to understand more what these kinds of creatures do. So 
it uses a very special queue, the recognition queue, right, for deciding between two food options. The recognition queue already has been discussed uh, about the about people in terms of recognition heuristic, as I said before. It's a very special queue. One could expect that there are many other very special queues that are just not ones and zeros, as you've been seeing in part of these presentations, but they have very high content, very, a very privileged place in human cognition. We need to find and study these queues in more detail. So far, we have done it mostly for the recognition queue. Um, Oliver Vito from Klagenfurt at some point had an idea about the seniority queue. This is a little bit of a generalization of recognition queue in the sense that he was saying uh, we, we, we give a privileged status to things we recognize and more generally we give a privileged status to things that are older. Because it doesn't always work. But in some things it does. If you want the advice of a colleague for your job search, you are more likely to go to an older professor in your department than to an assistant professor in your department. So this could also be an idea for a special queue, the seniority queue. We need to know more about these queues. Um, a second open idea has to do with uh, leptothorax aldipenis, who, as I said, was very, very creative in creating his own queues, his own attributes. And simply put, we haven't done so much either into studying how people go as Jerome Bruner said, beyond the information given. So he identified thinking, good thinking, with going beyond the information given. That's exactly what that is, creating your own attribute. This is a very creative approach to making your decisions. And that simply also hasn't really been done as far as I can tell. And finally, let me leave you with the last slide during the discussion, uh, which would be a summary of the, of the, ta the take home message of this. Uh, of this lecture. So, first, uh, we pointed out that heuristics do not need a lot of information. They need to order these cues. That's about the parameter calibration that they need to do. Tallying doesn't even need to do that, only needs to find the direction of the cues, as we say. Definitely, they need less information than standard decision theoretic models. And, they're in better rapport with people, at least in the sense that they come from people. The stimulus for considering these models came from the behavior of animals and from people. Again, recall that these two things, there were challenges for standard decision theory. So that's a good thing we do not have these challenges. And in the end, um, we were also happy to find that heuristics can perform better than standard decision theoretic models in some cases. Not in all, in some cases. The opposite is also possible. Because exactly of this last fact that we need to combine, this would be the last thing I would say. In a way, if, if you get interested in all this, it's actually a huge open area to think from all your specific points of view in your discipline and also with different methods, analytical or empirical uh, or with simulations. Uh, exactly how this combination of standard decision theory and heuristics can be more uh, effective. So, thank you very much.